Hi, I'm Ken Barron. The story is interesting because uh, God worked in my life in an amazing way. All of these things that have been attributed to me are really just to honor the Lord. So, so I traveled around the world with the president, and Mrs. Reagan. Working with Mrs. Reagan was one of the high points of my life. Now, all of the things that I've done uh, are, are all because of God. I came in and helped start Ronald McDonald House Charities, and we started building Ronald McDonald Houses around the world. I started being bold in my faith. The people at McDonald's didn't really like it too much, so I, I retired. I quit. I was retired from McDonald's for one day, and then I went to work for Franklin Graham. My Hope campaign that we're developing here at the Billy Graham Evangelist Association is not new. We've done it in 57 countries where we filled, again, a need for people. We want them to see Jesus. My title is Chief of Staff at the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. I'd rather be introduced as a servant of the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, Ken Barron. It's great to follow that uh, last segment. Uh, I was the head of nutrition for McDonald's for a few years. So I'm sitting there feeling very guilty that one out of three children in the country are overweight and obese. Uh, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. No, it's really terrible, but we did try when I was at McDonald's to, to turn that around, and as, as you probably have seen, McDonald's has changed quite a bit. Uh, I was in McDonald's yesterday looking at the menu board, and they list all the calories up there. That was required by law, but we did change the menus uh, quite a bit, put in salads and low-fat yogurt parfait under my watch, which was good because I've always been conscious of of health and fitness uh, ever since I started to become healthy again. I'm, I'm a Jew from New York. Uh, that's all right. We have one other Lunsman in the group. Uh, I became a drug addict when I was young, addicted to heroin. I uh, wound up living in the, under a bridge in Houston, Texas, uh, where a Catholic nun convinced me that I should God had other plans for me. I was obviously not following what God was telling me to do, but God was leading me. I wound up uh, in a drug program in Houston, wound up living there in the drug program for eight years. I uh, became president of the organization. Uh, while I was there, we started some businesses that President Reagan, had, uh, his staff had recognized. He came down and visited uh, this program, and next I found myself working in the White House as project, uh, Director of Projects and Policy for Nancy Reagan. So I actually went from the outhouse to the White House, and, and, and that, is, that is true. Uh, after a few years traveling around the world with the Reagans, I was uh, recruited by McDonald's Corporation to try to pull together their charitable work on an international level, which I did. Uh, I had a lot of great people around me, so it wasn't me, and what I didn't know was until 10 years later that it was God directing every step of my life, and that is why I'm actually standing here today, uh, as all of you are sitting here, that God directs our lives. Uh, I, I went from Ronald Reagan to Ronald McDonald. And my son, Adam, who is now 32, said, Dad, I like that clown a whole lot more. But I was involved in politics for a while. I was in the not-for-profit world for a while. I was in the government world for a while. Then I went to the corporate sector and stayed at McDonald's 20 years. While I was there, I met a man named Paul Saber. Paul uh, was a very strong Christian. We were in a car, a Ferrari, driving around the country in a charity race. And Paul kept egging me to drive faster and faster. And I looked at him and I said, Boy, you don't seem like you're afraid to die. He said, no, nope. he says, because I know where I'm going. And I said, what does that mean? He said, I know, Ken, you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, but let me share that with you. At that point, I slammed on the brakes, and I said, Paul, I, I'm a Jew. I, I don't want to hear all that. I live a pretty spiritual life as it is. And, and <laughs> I look back at that, and that was a crazy statement. And... Uh, he never gave up on me. It took him 10 years 
uh, I had married my beautiful wife, Sophia, who is sitting down here in the front. Uh, between us, we had seven children. And uh, we were out to dinner, and I said, you know, Paul, I've got everything in the world that I could possibly want. I've got a great job. I'm making a lot of money. Uh, I have a beautiful wife, a great family. But I'm, j I'm just not... Something's wrong. I've got this hole in my heart. I never heard the word hole in my heart or the phrase that I know of until that night. Now, you get into the Christian world, you hear it all the time, but I hadn't heard that. And he said, well, Ken, I've been telling you for 10 years what you need to do. I said, well, I'm a Jew. I mean, do we need to, like, build a chuppah or go to a synagogue or a church or something? He said, no, just pray with me. We sat there and prayed uh, the sinner's prayer, and it was like my whole life passed in front of my eyes. Uh, tears started flowing that to this day, I, I, I will, it will never be duplicated. Uh, I saw things pass in front of me, and uh, a burden was lifted off of my shoulders like nothing else. And uh, it was just a, a wonderful feeling my friend who owned the restaurant that we were at came out and said, was it the food? I said, yeah, it was the food of the Holy Spirit. So, so that's, that's how that happened. And then I, I continued on with McDonald's. As I said, you saw in the video, the people at McDonald's didn't take much to opening a meeting with prayer. Uh, they weren't used to that. So uh, I continued to, to be bold about my faith, as we're called to do. And uh, things started to get rougher for me at McDonald's and competing with all the secular things and uh, we did build a charity that is very well known around the world uh, some of you may have used Ronald McDonald houses during your lifetime or family members uh, I pray not but if you have it's it's probably been a blessing and uh, in 2007 2006 I had just come back from going around the world a couple of times and I said to Sophia I'm really tired uh, and I think God's calling me to do something else N not knowing that, I went in and I quit. I called Sophia. I told her that I, I, I quit. And she yelled Yahoo. And the phone rang as I was driving home. And it was Paul Saber, the guy who led me to Christ. He said, Ken, you know I'm on the board of Samaritan's Purse and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. I'm going to go down there and help Franklin Graham. What do you think about doing that? I said, you're out of your mind. I can't, I can't do that. I'm a baby in my faith. I don't know anything. Well, I, I took a trip down here to Charlotte. Um, I met Franklin, and that was it. Uh, he's a very convincing man. And he said, what a blessing it would be if you would come and help us. So that's how we came down here. That's over five years ago. So we're blessed to be here. I know that it was only God's work. I want to tell you one other piece of this whole story. When I was 16, my dad, Jewish father, Jewish mother, Orthodox family, when I was using drugs, kicked me out of the house. Told me I never want to see you again. When I went to the White House, <clears throat> I hadn't talked to him for many years. When I went to the White House, they started talking to me again. They called me, and it, I thought disingenuous, but they're my parents, and they love me, and uh, I needed to reconcile with them. I called them the day I accepted Christ. And I knew this is going to be the second time I get disowned. Jews just don't see it this way. And I told my dad, I said, Dad, I just want to call you and tell you that uh, last night I prayed to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And he started crying. And I knew that was coming. And then my mother gets on the phone and she says, Ken, what did you tell your father? What got him so upset? I said, well, I told him that last night. I prayed to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And she paused for a minute and there was silence. More tears from my father. And then she said to me, he's not crying tears of sadness. Because when we were looking for help for you, for your drug problem, we found Jesus too. My, my, dad, my dad just passed away about two months ago, and I was blessed to go down to a Messianic synagogue in Houston 
and uh, get up and speak to his congregation that he helped start. And it was just a blessing. My mom's still going strong. She's 90 and is like free as a bird and just, uh, I think she's on a cruise right now somewhere. She's having a ball. Uh, but it, my dad died at 97, so we've got some genes unless I cut a few of them off. Anyway, that's my story. Uh, there have been a lot of things happen. Now with Billy Graham, as you see what's going on in the country today, and the active role that Franklin has taken, and the active role that Mr. Graham has once taken, and people have criticized, criticized us for taking this stand on moral uh, and biblical values, uh, but we expected that. Uh, this is a different time than 60 years ago when Billy Graham was preaching. It's a different time in our lives, and, and we continue to see the world uh, eroding as God gets farther out of our lives. And, and Mr. Graham, consciously with Franklin, decided we really need to take a stand at this time. So you've seen ads all over the country promoting biblical values. We, we had something to do, as Tammy would tell you, about the North Carolina same-sex marriage amendment. Uh, it, it wasn't our goal to get involved in a political sense at all. And it's not Franklin's goal to be in a political sense at all. It's just to get Christians to recognize their Christians. Yesterday on the radio I heard, uh, uh, I think it was Bob Jeffers was talking, and he said he was in a, at the Capitol, there was a Jewish man in a Bible study, and he hadn't spoken in this Bible study because he's Jewish, nobody ever called on him. They finally called on him to do the closing prayer, and he said, I pray that every Muslim will come to know Jesus Christ. I pray that every Jew will come to know Jesus Christ. And I pray that every Christian will come to know Jesus Christ. And that's the conversation today, and, and come on up, Ken, because I'll go on forever if you don't. The, the conversation earlier today was how, how do you, how do we show the love of Jesus Christ without being considered bigots or uh, r radical right-wing people? And, and that's what we get. And uh, Ken knows that. He's, he, he asked the question earlier. I don't know the answer to that. I, as I said, I'm a Jew from New York. Um, I found that Jesus Christ is my Savior. There's nothing else. And Sathya and I share that, that God comes first in our lives now. We've made a lot of mistakes. We've had a lot of tragedy in our lives. Uh, it's been awful, but we've had a lot of great times. One thing before, before I turn it over, Ken, Tom Phillips, are you there, Tom? Tom Phillips and his wife, Weed, had just walked in. Tom is the, the, the vice president of the Billy Graham Library. If you haven't been there, please, please go visit the library and, and visit with Tom, and uh, it'll give you great tours, but it really does trace the history of, of Mr. Graham and what God did through his life. And uh, I'm so appreciative. We've got some other people here from BGA, Amy Pitt, who's my executive assistant, and Doug Barrett. So if anything, any questions about BGA, you can ask them. Just don't ask them anything about politics. <laughs> All right, let's go over here and grab a seat here, and let's sure. talk a little bit. I, I'm sorry, I went a little longer than I should have. Uh, no, yeah. you're fine. Uh, so we were talking a few moments ago uh, before we get started uh, in the lunchroom, and, and you know, I, I, Reagan's one of my heroes. And so since I'm on the mic, I get to ask the questions. And so I thought, uh, we, I want to get to some Reagan questions. But first, um, I'm so impressed by your story, what God has done in your life. But the theme of this conference and the name of the conference is Crave. And so uh, I have some friends who uh, have, have struggled with substance abuse. And they have told me many times that even though they've gotten the victory over it, it still is a battle for them every day of their life. And so take us back to the drug addiction and, and, and you got out of it and then God eventually saved you and all this. But what's it like when you, when you start to crave new things and you're, you're craving a drug and you're, we heard about sugar being a drug and, and each one of us has a weakness in an area where we can, the evil one can use against us and to develop healthy appetites and to defeat those negative appetites. How did you do it in your life? Well, I have that sugar addiction, too, so yeah. I, I can't say too much about that. But my wife's been a great influence in, in helping me get on this diet that if you can grow it, pick it, catch it, or something else. What's the other one? You can eat it. Somebody can shoot, shoot it. it. Yeah, that's good. That's a good We're one. in North Carolina. Yeah. Woo! 
Woo! <laughs> I, well, when I got into drugs, it was a, as a result of, of, of a lot of insecurity, a lot of anxiety that I didn't know. I had this, I told my, I used to tell my father I had this rodent eating away at my stomach. I didn't know what it was. It just eat away and probably now it would have been diagnosed as anxiety or, you know, and again, I wasn't a Christian to turn toward the Bible for an answer there, but uh, peer pressure led me into that. And then as I went through treatment, it took a cycle and uh, I don't know, was it Tammy? Somebody was talking about this cycle. The, uh, it was uh, about sugar. The more you eat, the more you crave. And that's the same with drugs. Drugs are a result of pain, emotional pain or physical pain. So the more pain that you have, uh, the more drugs you'll use. And the, m and, and the reason for that pain is while you're using drugs, you do a lot more things that create a lot more pain and guilt. And, you know, you lie, you cheat, you steal, you do things to, to people. And that when you come off of that, you're flooded with this great sense of guilt. And if you don't ever break that cycle, reconcile yourself with the people that you've, you've hurt or, or get forgiven by God, you're not going to solve that and you keep going back. So you have to be very careful. You have to be very, very cautious to stay away from people that are going to influence you and that will tempt you. And it's, it's, it's like anything. Temptation is the hardest thing to get out of. While you're sitting there looking at this, I didn't think I could live without drugs. I was in a point where I, I remember the first time I ever prayed, I was sitting in a hospital bed in St. Joseph's Hospital in Houston. This is when that Catholic nun had gotten me into the hospital. And I sat on the edge of the bed. It was one of those crisis prayers. Lord, if you get me out of this, I'll never do it again. I forgot about that prayer, but it came back many years later. But uh, I didn't think I could live without it. So it took a lot of intervening with a lot of people and a lot of time. And the farther you distance yourself from it and you fill your life with other things, I became a fitness fanatic and, and other things to fill that void, uh, you're not going to cure it. It's not one simple thing, but it is all-encompassing and all your life is just absorbed by it. You've led it uh, every, uh, excuse me, you've led at high levels in all of the major sectors, uh, effectively, with government, uh, business, and now in ministry. Um, I'm just curious, after all that experience, uh, leading under people, leading up, leading sideways, leading down in those three different um, channels of society, as you look back on it in this moment, uh, talk about some of the leadership principles that cross over, that are consistent throughout, and then some of the things you've learned along the way, the pitfalls uh, that you've learned to step around. I think it'd be great for people to hear that because you've moved well between those three channels. Well, I, I think about that a lot, and, and let me first say that I consider myself uh, as deep as sunburn. I, I really do. I mean, I, I, I don't know what it is that, that is, a, if you ask me what my strengths are, I, I really couldn't tell you. And I can tell you what other people say they are, but I can't tell you in, in my heart what they are. I, I can't tell you. I do know that being a good leader requires you to be a good follower. You, can, you can't be a good leader without being a good follower. You can't do it. And, and the thing that I think has helped me the most in leading is to understand the guy who washes the dishes to the, to the guys in the boardroom. And that has been where I've been most effective on, on building bridges between those people and understanding and leading with compassion rather than leading by dictatorship. And I've worked for both kinds of people. And it's very difficult to, when you work for somebody like that and you are representing them to, to represent that type of leadership as well as your own. But, but you do it by understanding how people react. And it's the, the old treat people like you'd like to be treated. You know, it's the, the golden rule and, and the Bible talks about that and we just need to pay attention to it. Pride is the biggest enemy of leadership. Absolutely is. And, and in fact, uh, we were up at Liberty uh, a few weeks ago. My daughter's a freshman at Liberty. And Jonathan Falwell preached on Sunday at Thomas Rhodes and, and did a, a whole sermon on leadership and said that. Pride is the enemy of leadership. And it's hard not to be prideful. And I think that's why the Lord took me through the drug addiction and living in the streets and dragging me through that mess and going through so much stuff so that uh, I pray that pride would not be, be part of my leadership. And uh, I try to communicate that to the people that I lead. 
All right, now we get to talk about Ronald Reagan. I'm very, very excited. I told you I could spend days with you just asking you questions. This is a man who worked closely with the Reagans, traveled with them all around the world, and, and he is known as the great communicator. And if I would have ever had the honor to sit with the man and ask him questions, I would have spent almost all my time asking him about communication. And so you work closely with him, and uh, he had the ability to cross the political aisle. Whether you agree with all his politics, he was very uh, much admired. And then when we saw him pass... Uh, the outpouring of admiration from a nation, much divided, really uh, accent, really put an underline and, and bolded that whole idea that he was just so much admired. I think it's because he was a tremendous communicator. As someone who spent a lot of time with him, uh, what would you say w were the keys? What made him such a wonderful communicator to people? Because he connected in a way that we've not seen with many modern politicians. Well, I, I think, first of all, he was very self-effacing. You know, he, he wouldn't ever take himself too seriously. And he felt, uh, and he was a common man that came from the Great Plains and, and Illinois, and he just was a, a very humble person. For all the things that he had done, he managed to maintain his humility. And I think in that case, you would see a person that, if you, if you use the word pride and Ronald Reagan in the same sentence, it would not exist. It, it just would be an oxymoron. He was wonderful. I think Mrs. Reagan had, uh, uh, and, I, and I love Mrs. Reagan, she, she gave me a chance as a drug addict. She had me come into the White House. So, but she had much more of an ego than he did. And she balanced a lot of his things where he would have been almost too kind to people. She could stand up and say, no, and she used the word Ronnie, you need to do this. Uh, he did call her mommy, uh, I've got to say that, in meetings and, and personal times. But he was just a wonderful man. He, he, would, he would spend time uh, at the ranch, in the trailer with the Secret Service agents. He would spend time with the, with the ushers in the White House. And so he never placed himself apart from anybody. And I think that's what you're seeing, you know, uh, an aloofness, a pride. And he surrounded himself with some of the best people in the world. And I went to the Reagan Centennial. Cynthia and I were out at the Reagan Centennial uh, almost a year ago now. And the staff, all of us that were staff members, there were tons of donors there, thousands of donors. We got treated the best of anybody. It was wonderful because they always appreciated the people that worked for them and showed that. And I think President Reagan could, could spend time working on how to communicate and how to reach but by talking to people that understood that, that he could learn from and understand what was going on. I want you to talk about his positivity, phrases that uh, will forever exist in the political pantheon, like a shining city on a hill and morning in America. And we know there's great speechwriters involved. We understand that. But how much of that truly was genuine to him, that he was not Pollyanna positive, but, but casting a positive vision. Talk about that side of it. Well, he's a great patriot. And the first time I ever met with him was at this drug program that I was running. He sat down. He was supposed to talk to me for 10 minutes. It wound up to be two hours. And he said to me, is it okay, Ken, if I talk to all these residents of the drug program and I say that uh, my body is the temple of my soul, of my spirit? And I, I just look at and Again, I'm not a Christian. And he was... He was being, trying to be politically correct, but he was also sharing with his, his upbringing. His father was an alcoholic. Uh, he came home to find his father passed down on the steps. Uh, he, he, he was a lifeguard. I mean, he, he did a lot of things, and he was kind of out of himself. But those things were really him. He, he, he has a lot of handwritten notes. You've seen the, the notes to, to Nancy Reagan that he wrote, that great book about love letters to, to his wife. Uh, that was real. Uh, it was nothing. He was a great patriot. And he believed that this country was a place of opportunity like it is today. And, and we've seen too much dependence on large government. We've seen way too much. We think the government is a corporation that is going to, you know, do something that's going to help us all. We are the government. And, and President Reagan recognized that, that we are the government. He's a very faithful man. He was... Uh, uh, he, there's there's a, a YouTube video that I would encourage you all to go to, and it's it, just type in Ronald Reagan, <coughs> and uh, uh, I think it's Salvation or or, or uh, 
John 3.16, where in his words, and I don't know if you've ever seen that, Ken, it is a wonderful video, about four minutes long, starts out with a picture of him with a cowboy hat on. It is a wonderful piece. If any of you have a chance tonight, just pull that up, and you will see how faithful he was to the teachings of the Bible and his, his love for Jesus Christ. And I think that guided him, and he knew that humility was the biggest point, and that's what we all have to do. Leadership, the, the, the enemy of leadership is pride. And we've got a great opportunity now, and I, I, wish, we, I wish we could really show the love of Jesus Christ to all of us, that we could emulate Jesus Christ without getting into arguments with people. <laughs> it just seems like politics takes us down a bad road. Um. Two final things for you. One, could you share a quick private story, uh, a fun moment with the Reagans, whether it be just, I know you got a million stories, but share a fun story that uh, obviously you'd never hear had you been, unless you'd been hanging out with them as you did. Well, every Monday we'd have a staff meeting, or every Monday we were in town, we'd have a staff meeting in the residence, Mrs. Reagan. She didn't have an office. Uh, she used the, the residence for that. Uh, although one time we did set an office up for her to do a, an interview to make it look like she had an office. But uh, it's, it's a lot of optics, as you know. If, uh, now, you know, the new term is optics. And uh, it's the way things look and the way things appear. But President Reagan would walk in there, and I was sitting with my back to the door every Monday. We had to sit in the same seats so Mrs. Reagan would remember our names. And she, she would, it, it was just a, it was a, repetitive thing, and the president would come up at 5 o'clock, 5 o'clock, and everybody's eyes would go up behind me at the door, and I knew that the president was there, and he'd always ask, or, or say, well, is this a staff meeting? And, uh, yes, Mr. President, he said, and, and one time he said, uh, he had just had a, uh, some polyps removed from his colon, and he had, uh, he was laid up for a couple of days. In fact, we went out and visited an aircraft carrier with Mrs. Reagan to make up for one of those trips. It was a great experience, but he walks in, he says, this is a staff meeting, yes, and press secretary, he says, I I've got to tell you, I made a terrible mistake. And Elaine Crispin, who was the press secretary, always had a very acerbic tongue, and she looked up and said, Mr. President, when the President of the United States says he made a terrible mistake, we all want to know what it is. He said, well, it has to do with my recent surgery. And Mrs. Reagan was very concerned with his health, and she sits up on the edge of the couch like this. She says, Ronnie, what are you talking about? You had the best medical care there was. He said, that's just it. He said, uh, uh, I had a naval commander uh, operate on me, but because of the nature of the surgery, it should have been a rear admiral. <laughs> But he was always full of jokes like that. Uh, one time he came up and he did that and he shared with us, uh, he shared with us a, a, a story. We thought it was a joke. And he said, uh, you know my friend Gaddafi? What do you think? You know my friend Gaddafi? And Elaine Crispin again says, uh, yeah, we all know who he is. Well, do you know what he did today? And we're waiting for the punchline. He says, well, he pointed some of his missiles at us. So we just bombed him. I mean, that's what he said. And I'm going, the guy sitting next to me, Marty Coyne, says, Ken, he's serious. <laughs> so we run down to our office. Now, you have to remember, 1983 to 86, when I said, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have computers. Look at how far we have come. We ran the country without computers and cell phones. And we had two-way radios, you know, talking to them and click, click. But... Uh, we didn't have, so we ran down. I had the only TV in my office in the East Wing. My office is right in the East Wing. And we all gather into my office, and there's CNN, which was on then, reporting this attack. And you all remember when uh, it, it came back in history recently when, when his, his family, Gaddafi's family was killed during that raid. So we were in a lot of that. There were all kinds of things. I had the only office with a safe, so I'd get all the secret documents from the CIA that we'd brief the president with. I mean, I'm a drug addict, you know. <laughs> I'm a Jew from New York. <laughs> what am I doing here? And then, and then I went to McDonald's, and, and I, I ran around the McDonald's house chair. I was president of that, and then I was a senior vice president of McDonald's. And my job was corporate social responsibility, so I had animal welfare, 
How do you run animal welfare at McDonald's? You're killing a billion cows a day. I said, let's give them all a Happy Meal before they slit their throat. And I, I, it, it, then I become head of nutrition. Sathya's job, uh, she owns a barbershop called McClip. It's in the McDonald's headquarters in Chicago. And that's where we met, in the barbershop. She cut my hair. And I just fell in love with her because she rubbed the back of my head. And it felt so good. Hey, I by the way, that's how it started with Samson. I know, but, but look what happened to me. She cut my hair and things all happened for the good. I came to Christ. So, so it, it's, a, it's a blessing, but, but she had the barbershop, McDonald's, and, and one of her customers was a guy named Jim Cantalupo who became CEO. He died after being at the company for a year. He retired, come back, died of a heart attack, uh, and then he was followed by another guy who died seven months later uh, as the... Uh, a CEO of 43-year-old. It was interesting because we were thinking that's not the job you want to go after. You know, nobody wants to be the CEO of McDonald's because you die. But Jim put, trusted me because he knew me and he knew Seth so he put me in charge of nutrition. Two weeks after I got the job, the movie Super Size Me came out. So challenges in life. God puts all these things, but nothing he can't handle. And I continue to find that to this very day. So Ronald Reagan, Ronald McDonald, uh, and now to be in the place where I don't know if this is the place God's going to end my career or what, but he's certainly preparing me for whatever's next. And, and I say, again, this is not me doing this. This is all God doing this. So I, hope, I hope that comes through loud and clear that I really have nothing to do with it. Uh, the only strength I get is from God first and then my wife second. And uh, I just, I hope that comes across because that's how I really feel and really believe. So thanks, thanks for having me today. I appreciate being here. I, I, you know, it occurs to me that uh, the only thing that's missing right now is a fire pit and some Swiss miss. You know what I mean? I could just hear story after story after story from this wonderful man of God. And uh, I tell you what, if your heart's not encouraged after hearing that, you need to go see a cardiologist. You've got some big-time problems. Hey, Crave, you know what I'm going to ask you to do. We show Ken Barron some big love? Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Bless you. Thank you so much.